That's Isaiah chapter 49, starting at verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves. Because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. That's Acts 28, starting at verse 1. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun, begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him and healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier that guarded him. So what is our problem this afternoon? Well, it's now December, there's so much to do, so little time to do it. But of course, there's more than that. What's our problem? Maybe we are struggling to make ends meet. There are pressures at work. There are strained relationships. But there's more. What's the problem? 
health concerns maybe, an uncertain future. There's more. This is not just about us. Bigger, much bigger. What's the world's problem? Inequality and injustice. Well, there's more. What's the world's problem? Well, hostilities and war. Well, there's more. For everyone, what's the problem? Death. A friend of mine died just this week. And yet, there's more. Because behind and in all of these things, in all our difficulties and all these problems in our world, stands Satan, the devil. He is very real and he is so powerful. Now, the developed world scoffs at this. They'll ridicule the very idea, which shows that we here in the West haven't really progressed very far at all if we don't grasp these basics about the way things are. Presumably, the denying of his existence is precisely how the devil wants it to be, giving him the opportunity to prowl around to continue his devouring work. But this is our great adversary, the world's foremost enemy. In the grand, eternal scheme of things, whether we and the world will be okay depends on what happens to Satan. Now, our passage in Acts 28 this afternoon doesn't name Satan or the devil, but then again, you'll remember last week's account in Acts 27 of the crossing of the sea didn't mention Lord or Jesus or sin or cross or resurrection either. But this, remember, is the dramatic conclusion to Luke's account all the way through his gospel and here in Acts. Luke wants this to pack a punch. Surely we think this must be about Jesus. And yet Luke seems to think that he is going to make his point most effectively and powerfully if he makes us work to see it. And so this afternoon, that's what we're going to do. And it will be worth it what Luke wants us to be persuaded and convinced of is that Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious. There is a deceptively short sentence towards the end of our passage. It sounds like a minor geographical observation when in fact this is the climax the book of Acts has been building towards. It comes at the end of verse 14. And so we came to Rome. That is the triumphant announcement of victory. How so? Well, Luke has set up his whole book of Acts so that everything depends on Paul reaching Rome. Because if Paul gets to Rome, he gets to testify who is the Lord of all. Well, not Caesar, but Jesus Christ. And we've seen, haven't we, throughout Acts, Paul has been declaring Jesus is Lord and been opposed then whenever he goes. Then the Spirit tells Paul and the Lord Jesus tells Paul, go to Rome via Jerusalem. Well, Paul makes it to Jerusalem, but you'll remember the Jews were determined to kill Paul. We saw riots and plots and trials, and through them all, Paul came through unscathed. But then remember last week, Acts 27, this dramatic sea crossing. Here we had the chaos of the elements, the winds, the waves, the deep of the sea, throwing everything at Paul, at that ship, to stop him from reaching Rome. But we saw how Paul, together with everyone else on board, made it safely to land. Now, as we read this, all that Paul has faced so far, the religious authorities, the mobs, the false gods, these chaotic elements, they are all manifestations of Satan's malign power and influence in our world. And yet, even at this point, you could still ask, okay, but what about Satan himself? Well, today's verses confirm the astonishing and wonderful news. Jesus is victorious over Satan. 
He is victorious over Satan. To realize the significance of what happens here on Malta, we need to start at the beginning, the very beginning. So in Genesis, humanity is created in the garden. But remember then, the serpent appears, who is Satan, implacably hostile to God, to creation, to all God's people. Humanity falls for the serpent's lies, turns against God. It's a disaster. The world is ruined, full of disease, decay, death. This is now a disaster. What is going to happen? Well, God curses that serpent, but that's not enough. The serpent must be crushed. And so God promises that is exactly what he will do. But how will God do that? So we read on. God takes one man, Abraham, becomes the nation of Israel. God rescues Israel, remember, through the waters of the Red Sea. But then what happens on the other side in the wilderness? Well, poisonous serpents appear to attack the people because Satan, the serpent, is not yet crushed. We need a better rescue. In time, Jesus comes. And in Luke's gospel, chapters three and four, we find Jesus beginning his public ministry. First, he was baptized. That is, again, going through water, just like at the Red Sea. And then Jesus, just like Israel, is taken straight into the wilderness where he is tempted by the devil. Do you remember the devil dares to quote scripture at Jesus from Psalm 91? But we said those words earlier. They're on the sheet if you want to look. After the words the devil quotes, the very next line goes on to say, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. So you see that in the Bible, the serpent stands for Satan, the devil. Here is the problem, humanity's problem, the world's problem. Satan is opposed to God and all his ways. He is powerful. So can he himself, Satan, stop Paul from reaching Rome where Paul will there declare once and for all that Jesus is more powerful, Lord of all? Well, notice Acts 27. Again, it's crossing the water. And then they arrive in Malta. But no no sooner has Paul begun to warm himself, we're told he is attacked by a viper. A snake. And Luke wants us to see here is Satan's final attempt at stopping Paul. But Paul, verse 5, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Look how Satan is described there, the serpent. A creature, not God, not powerful in the end. And look where he ends up, in the fire of God's judgment. But Paul, has made it through, and now he gets to Rome. And so we are to be persuaded this message that Paul was to declare at the heart of the empire, the known world, is confirmed to be true. Jesus is Lord of all. There's more to persuade us of this. Read on Acts 28. Look, we hear of healings. Now, I hope as that was read, you thought, that's actually very odd. We know from earlier in Acts that Paul can do that. Why record that right here at the end of Acts like this? Well, again, Luke wants you to remember what you've seen so far in his writings. And in particular, what we see in Luke 4. Now, Luke 3 and 4, that's the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So as we've heard already, that's where Jesus was baptized and then tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Straight after that, Jesus explains why he has come. He says he's come for people like the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the Syria. That is, Jesus straight away says, I have good news for far off people. Read on, Luke 4, Jesus then heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then he performs more healings. And he does this by laying on of hands. And then still in Luke 4, together with healings, Jesus drives out demons at the same time. This sets a pattern then for the rest of Luke's gospel. Healings go together with driving out demons. 
Try and hold those details in mind. And with that, let's go back now here to Acts 28. So we had the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. This is the end of Paul's public ministry in Acts. So we've seen he has this showdown with the viper, which is proved to be powerless. But then look, verse 8. Publius's relative is healed, just as Jesus healed Peter's relative. How then did Paul heal? Look at the end of verse 8. By the laying on of hands, just like with Jesus. And then Paul heals many more, just like Jesus did. So as we see that pattern in Luke Acts, that if lots of people are being healed, the demons are being driven out. In fact, look at what we're told here in verse 9. The rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. Now, isn't that astounding? Can you imagine? We're talking about a disease-free island. And the point is, the victory over Satan is complete. So from the start of Jesus' public ministry to the end of Paul's public ministry, it's now all finished. Satan is defeated. Jesus is victorious. And this makes sense because it's just as Jesus told us it would be in Luke chapter 10. He said to his disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Well, the serpent attacked Paul, but he suffered no harm. He had that authority to heal, to trample over Satan's realm. All because Jesus is victorious. Satan is defeated. But there's more to see in these verses. If Satan really is the arch enemy of God's people, standing behind all this evil in our world, how is it that he has been defeated? Well, it's come already in Luke and Acts, but Luke here wants to show us again. Jesus is victorious over Satan through his death and resurrection, through Jesus' death and resurrection. So do you remember last week as we crossed the sea, that tempestuous waters, that was a dramatic demonstration of the achievement of Jesus' death and resurrection. But now there is more here on Malta. I mean, very simply, obviously, what happened to Paul? Well, he was attacked in a way that would be assumed to be fatal, a lethal snake. He would surely die. The islands were waiting for it to happen. But he suffered no harm. Life from the dead. But there's more than that. Notice we're only given one little bit of what the islanders' people actually say. Comes in verse 4. And they say, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Clearly, Luke wants us to think about what these people have said. Well, they say Paul is a murderer. And actually, that's right. Paul did play his part in putting Christians to death. So then what does justice demand? So the islanders here speak of this goddess justice with the Greek name Dike. Now here in the city of London, if you go in that direction a little bit, you'll soon come across the Old Bailey, the central criminal court. Look up on the top and uh, you will see Lady Justice. She'll have the sword in one hand and the scales in the other. Now, Lady Justice is, in fact, the Greek goddess Themis. And uh, Themis is the mother of Dike, who we've got in this passage. Amazing connection. The point is, both of them are the goddesses of justice. And so the islanders invoke the goddess Dike, assuming that if Paul is going to die, as they think he surely will, that will be the doing of the goddess justice. Now, we're readers of Luke, so we don't need to invoke this goddess of justice because we know the one true God is a God of justice for whom sin must be punished. So where then does that leave Paul the murderer? Those islanders are right. He should die. 
But then as you read it, you think, well, where does that leave you and me? What about all that we have done and said and thought? What do we deserve if justice was done? And here we find our greatest problem. Here is why Satan is so powerful. The name Satan means the accuser. And Satan's accusation, not only to us, but before God, is to say, that person has sinned. Sin deserves death. They must die. And it is a very strong accusation. We have sinned. And God the judge himself has made it plain that sin deserves death. So what now? Satan will demand that justice is done. But verse 6, notice, the islanders saw that no misfortune came to Paul. That is, Paul did not die. The question is, why not, since he was a murderer, and that's what justice demands. And here Luke is pointing us to the answer to that question. Now that word misfortune here, it's a rare word in the New Testament. It means wrong or evil. So you could say here, no wrong came to Paul. And Luke uses this word only twice elsewhere. First of all, it's a couple of chapters ago, Acts 25, the Roman governor Festus said of Paul, if there is anything wrong about this man, And as we were reading that, we'd say, well, he's not wrong of the things that Jews are accusing him of, but he was a murderer. And yet we're told on Malta, no misfortune, no wrong came to him. How can that be fair or just? Well, there's one other use of this word for wrong. It comes in Luke chapter 23, that's towards the end of Luke's gospel. It is in fact the moments before Jesus' death. I wonder if you remember, there was that thief hanging on the cross next to him. And that thief declared, looking at Jesus, this man has done nothing wrong. And Luke wants us to see, it was at the cross that Jesus was victorious over Satan. Because that was right, Jesus did nothing wrong. He lived the perfect life, no sin. So therefore, Satan had no accusation to hold against Jesus. But at that cross, Jesus took on himself the wrongs that we have done. The murdering of Paul, whatever it is that you and I have said and thought and done. Jesus took those wrongs on himself and he died the death that our sins deserved. And that means justice has been done. So if Satan now was to try to demand that our sins were punished by death, we can look to the cross Because there, our sins were punished by death. The death of Jesus. And now Satan is powerless. He has no accusation, nothing to hold against us. Which is why on those crosses, Jesus could turn to that thief hanging next to him, that sinner, and say to him justly, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so it is for each and every one of us trusting in Jesus. So it's the victory of Jesus over Satan through his death and resurrection. And this finally is for all the nations through God's servant. So we're coming to the end of the book of Acts. The first half around chapters 1 to 12 of the book is largely the ministry of those original disciples, especially Peter. The focus was on getting the word of the Lord out to the Jews in Jerusalem and to those nearest Jerusalem and Israel as far as Antioch. From chapter 13 onwards, it's the apostle Paul that comes into focus. Paul sets out from the church in Antioch. Can you remember where was the first place that he went? Well, it's on the sheet. It was Cyprus. 
which we notice was an island, just like Malta. So that's the beginning and the end of Paul's ministry. And then on that island of Cyprus, Paul comes up against a magician. But this is what Paul says to him. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainous. So here's another connection between the start and end of Paul's ministry, both on an island and both up against the devil. And there on Cyprus, Paul is making it clear right from the beginning that he knows who he is up against ultimately. That magician is a son of the devil. Paul knows that Satan is using his means to stop Paul from proclaiming the message that Jesus is Lord. Or trying to, because Satan is defeated and he will fail. And sure enough, Acts progresses. We see the Apostle Paul takes this word of the Lord all over the Mediterranean world. Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, all Asia. And he takes the word to all sorts of people. We've seen a senior proconsul. We've seen a slave girl. We've seen a wealthy trader. We've seen a prison officer and plenty more. And notice who here on Malta is reached. Verse 2 calls them the native people. Or put literally, these are barbarians, which means not the Jews, not the Greeks either, but the non-Greek speakers, which is a way of speaking of those far, far away. Paul has reached them too. Now, why did Paul do all of this, his ministry? Well, quite simply, because Jesus told him to. Turn back with me to Acts chapter 26. This is the third time Paul describes his appearance, his experience on the Damascus Road where Jesus appeared to him. The risen Lord Jesus face to face with Paul. Let's hear again what Jesus told Paul to do. So Acts 26, we'll start reading at verse 16. Jesus is speaking and says to Paul, but rise and stand upon your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We've seen all that through the book, but we've also seen in the last couple of chapters. Do you remember that rescue on the sea came as darkness turned to light? And on that ship, there were hundreds of Gentiles. Every single one was saved. And now here in Acts 28, we are shown that Satan has lost his power. Notice here in Acts 26, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin. So this connection we've seen. If Satan is defeated, there is forgiveness. Well, why had Paul got this role? Well, look at the title he is given. Uh, verse 16, appoint you as a servant and witness. Now, particularly that first title of servant. It's an Old Testament title. comes from Isaiah 49, which we heard read earlier. Do you remember how that reading began? Like this, listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. Coastlands, which means in particular islands. That is, Isaiah prophesied long ago that islands like Cyprus and Malta would hear the message from God. And then Isaiah 49 goes on to say about this servant, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Do you see the promise God is making through Isaiah to save not only Israel, but for all the nations of the world. So you read Isaiah 49, the question is, who is the servant? Well, ultimately, of course, it's Jesus. Isaiah 53 tells us the servant would be crushed for our iniquities and then rise to life again for our forgiveness. Only Jesus can do that, but he's done it. But now Paul, if you like, steps in, in a sort of derivative sense, as this servant to make known the message to the nations. Back in Acts 28, there's some details we still haven't covered, but look 
what happens. When Paul is unharmed, look what the islanders conclude. End of verse 6, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, I wonder what you'd expect to happen next. Well, back in Acts 14, when the Lystrans treated Paul as if he was a god, Paul tore his garments and vehemently objected. But here, if anything like that happened, Luke doesn't tell us. Because Luke knows that we know that Paul is no god. Luke doesn't need to say that again. In fact, Luke wants us to think there is something right in what these islanders say. Because Paul here is acting like Jesus, who is God, who is the servant. And this again fits with Acts. Do you remember the beginning of Acts? Luke told us that his gospel was only what Jesus began to do and to teach. Which means all that we've seen in Acts is still Jesus' work as the news about him goes out. And so as Paul takes that message, even to this far off island and then to Rome, well, he's doing the servant's work, which is Jesus' work, which is God's work. And then from Paul, we are to then apply the message to ourselves. All of us today are witnesses to Jesus' work. We are continuing this work of the servant. So today, the work of treading down the serpent, treading down Satan, is ongoing. The victory has been won, but it just needs to be worked out. How then do we exercise this spiritual warfare? Same way Paul did. Declare the truth that Jesus is Lord. Now this afternoon we've covered a lot of ground, maybe too much, you're thinking. But the reason for that is because at the end of his work of Luke Acts, Luke is pulling all these threads together and seeing saying to us, can you see it? Can you see all that Jesus has achieved? He wants to, if you like, give us every reason to give us deep and sure confidence, even certainty about the way things are. Not that we're naive, we'll still face problems. There'll be plenty to try, you know, make life difficult. But, but Satan has been defeated. Jesus is victorious. So Luke is saying, as the work goes on, as you and I go out into the world this week, yes, difficulties, yes, trials, yes, opposition. Yes, Satan will still be trying to discourage you, to stop us trusting, to stop us speaking. But be assured... Jesus is the victorious Lord of all. So to take one other example, carol service season is upon us here at St. Helens. Starts on Tuesday. We expect, under praying, there will literally be thousands of people coming through these doors in this coming month. And we at St. Helens have put lots of effort into these services. We've got the trees and the decorations up already. There will be a warm welcome. There will be choirs and solos and duets. There'll be familiar carols, which we hope will be heartwarming, as they should be. There'll be mince pies and mulled wine, delicious, we expect and hope. We are chasing the high tingle factor. But of course, our aim through it all is to speak of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so let's be in no doubt, whatever the tingle factor, Satan will be on the prowl. He will want to do whatever he can to thwart what's going on. So let's pray. But also remember, he is defeated. Jesus is victorious. The cross and resurrection have crushed him once and for all. And so with God's help, at each of these carol services, we will be declaring the victory as we proclaim that gospel of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray as we close.
We do praise you, our Father, that Jesus is the victorious Lord of all, that he has defeated the devil through his death and resurrection. And we thank you that this news of Jesus as Lord is for all kinds of people and that it will reach them even through trials. And so would you give to us this confident assurance that we should have that will lead us to keep on serving Christ, playing our part in this ongoing work of witnessing to him. Amen. How can we read Acts for ourselves without mishandling it? Yeah, probably the biggest danger is to... Well, the, we, when you've got to understand the Bible, what is the way the Bible uses certain ideas and images and concepts? What's the thing that's been developed through the Bible and sometimes through a book like Luke Acts? Um, and so I try to give lots and lots of reasons why Luke seems here to want us to think. But notice what Luke is doing. He's trying to say this is so big, you have to pull in the Bible's teaching, what I've said in Luke before, so that you see for yourself. So he's, I think, saying if we were as steeped in Scripture as we should be and in taken his work of Luke Acts as seriously as we might have done, well, we'll see these connections and think that must be what he's talking about. I think it really does stretch credibility that... He just, at the climax of his account, think of Luke's gospel, how we take seriously every single passage in Luke, and there is great weight in every passage in that gospel. If right at the end of Luke, he just recounted something like this, it doesn't seem to make any sense. And then that forces you to dig deeper, and you think, how are these things? So the serpent, I think the serpent is therefore an opponent of God, and uh, stands for Satan. There's a number of places that uh, we can see that. Those of us in Romans are going to see it, well, in the summer at some point. So there's lots and lots of these things that you've just got to think very carefully. How does the Bible use this imagery and uh, apply it like that? Was that the only question or was there another one? Um, how do we um, read Acts without mishandling it? Yeah, just read Acts lots and lots of times. Read Luke lots and lots of times. Read the Bible lots and lots of times. And then ask, how does the Bible use these things? You know, there's this whole story. That's why I very briefly tried to mention those things. There's lots more reference to the serpent, or if you read Isaiah, the sea creatures or the dragons. There's lots of this sort of imagery, and uh, you can't end up doing nothing with it. But actually, you should think, what should I do with it? And what is the lesson these Bible writers are trying to use that imagery to convey these truths? And Aaron, you've mentioned a lot over the last couple of weeks that uh, it's important that Paul gets to Rome. Um, could you explain why that is? So it's just the way that this, you know, the way Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. We saw some of these things. We knew that whatever it was, Jerusalem was where the action is. And so, again, we've read Luke very carefully. Then we read Acts very carefully. And it's very clear, similarly-ish from halfway, Paul, we're told, has to get to Jerusalem. And we wonder why. Then the Lord Jesus appears to him and says, because you must testify to me there that Jesus is Lord. Testify to Christ. And in that day, Rome was the center of the world. As in, it was the Roman Empire. It was, if you like, the known world. That was the heart of it. So the way Luke has set up, the way Jesus has set it up, is to demonstrate that victory. The victory is one of the death and resurrection but the way Luke is set up is to say if Paul gets to Rome to declare Jesus is Lord we can be certain this message is for Jerusalem Judea Samaria and for the ends of the earth and it will achieve its purpose so go out and share it. Uh, similar to that um, you've been saying a lot that Jesus is Lord um, today Jesus is victorious how do you think that Luke wants us to respond to that revelation? So right at the beginning of Luke, do you remember, Luke wants us to have confidence or certainty. Um, in then Acts in particular, he told the disciples the word would go out to the ends of the earth. And then there are stages in Acts that we've seen where we're told the word multiplies or the word prevails mightily. So Luke is wanting us to be utterly persuaded that the word about Jesus, which is that he is Lord, is going to prevail. It is going to go out. And therefore... The outworking of that will be God's people, us, believing that for ourselves and confidently playing our part to make it known. A couple more questions about Satan. Um, so this first one, why does Satan want us to sin or to go to hell? 
I mean, we get to the doctrine of evil and there'll be ultimately questions we can't answer. But what's very clear, you know, Satan hates God. He's implacably opposed to God. So in one sense, anything God wants, Satan wants the opposite. That's the nature of sin. And Satan delights in harm and evil and in seemingly thwarting God and his plans, seeking to take glory away from the Lord. So any way he sees he can do that, he will seek to do it. And therefore, for us not to glorify God by turning away from him and continuing in that state, well, he would delight in that. You speak about Satan as if he's active in the world. Um, How can I tell if what I'm going through is just Satan uh, prowling around or kind of a broken world? How do we tell the difference between the natural side and the kind of the supernatural? I don't think we necessarily want to drive a distinction between them. So So think of the positive, so to speak, side. God is sovereign over all things. So God is at work in everything, absolutely everything, whether use that division, natural or supernatural. So if it's a good thing in this world, thank God for it, whether it would have, so to speak, we think happened anyway, or though it's a miracle, God did the good things. And then in a a similar way, uh, Satan is behind, or at least delighting, in all that is evil and bad. Which is not to say that God isn't at work through it, but Satan is also seeking to cause harm and to damage people. How do we, therefore, we should speak of it more, probably. I don't think we speak of it as much as the New Testament does. Interesting, first half of Acts is Peter. You read his first letter, he speaks of the devil prowling around. Then we've got Paul in the second half. You read Ephesians, a wonderful letter. Beginning of Ephesians, he makes a big deal that Jesus has been raised above all powers and authorities. And then at the end of Ephesians, he then, if you like, does the practical outworking. He says we are in a spiritual battle, so we should be aware of that, sometimes speak of it. But the applications he draws are trust the word of God and pray. So we are doing spiritual battle, even if we don't often use that language, but therefore apply it the way the Bible does. But we are I think part of the reason we have to realize it is that this is an enemy far greater than we can face in our own strength. So let me put it this way. Do we pray enough? No, we don't. We ought to pray more. If we were persuaded that our enemy was Satan in all the various ways we try and do ministry, that in our own strength, we would be futile, it would be hopeless. It might drive us to pray more. And one final question. What might this victory of Jesus over Satan look like now on this side of the new creation? Um, Some examples here. Is it that he won't be able to stop Jesus being declared as Lord? Or is there more, like he can't snatch away Christians? What will this victory look like? I mean, there are lots of things this victory will look like. But at the heart of it is that the victory has been won at the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. God's promises have come to fulfillment. He has disarmed rendered powerless, Satan now can hold nothing against us. That has been done. So why then the book of Acts? So that we realize then the outworking of that. So now Jesus' work as servant, well, he did the once and for all bit at the cross, but now it's the servant's work to get the word about Jesus to the ends of the earth. And we can be sure that will happen come what may. It is guaranteed. Nothing can thwart it. So we should be confident in that so it doesn't mean we know exactly who will become Christians or how exactly that will happen but we do know that the opposition to Jesus and the gospel will not succeed so therefore give yourself to that work while we are here we know the end result because the end result is dependent on will God accept me into his new creation will Jesus say well done good and faithful servant and the answer is yes because of Jesus death and resurrection so now I am freed in the confidence that the word about him will go out and those whom God wants will come in. So give myself to it.